Well, good morning, everybody, wherever you are in the world, and thank you for joining us. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marian priests here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. It's great to have some people back here. Our temperatures have warmed up a little bit. And thank you for joining us for the 84th class that we have done now in bringing you back to seminary. I've always said, I was asked a while ago what the happiest time of my life was, and I said, when I was in seminary. I would love to go back because it's where I learned about our faith, it's where I truly fell in love with our faith. So I decided to go back to seminary and bringing you with us and uh, bringing you, when you finish watching these videos, you will basically have the same education I had in seminary. And so, you love your faith when you really know your faith. So God bless you for joining us. And uh, we celebrate today, as Brother Mark showed on the screen, uh, Lords. The, yesterday was the feast day of Lords, February the 11th. I know we're a day late, but we'll explain why. And, um, and we'll explain some other important things of that day yesterday and that flows into also today. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you, send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and hearts to receive the grace you wish to give us. We especially ask for the situation in Arizona, as many have gathered um, in praise of, of evil, and we ask, Lord, that you forgive them, for they know not what they do but to also open their hardened hearts to receive your goodness and to know your love. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. What I'm referring to is this weekend, there is a um, world's largest gathering ever of Satanists who are, um, attempting to consecrate Arizona, and it won't be long before the country and then the world to Satan. What else can we do? Somebody asked me, well, a lot. There's a lot we can do. We first pray for their forgiveness, as we just did, because what did Jesus do on the cross? He said, forgive them. They know not what they do. I, I truly believe that. I think so many of these are just young people. They have absolutely no clue what they're even doing, and we have to ask God's forgiveness but most of all, that they open their hearts, uh, that they learn who God is so they can love him. That's what we're doing here today. And so we pray for that whole situation in Arizona. Now, <clears throat> yesterday we celebrated the Feast Day of Lords, but it's so important that I wanted to talk about it today. And just because yesterday was the Feast Day doesn't mean we forget about it now. Um, Lords France is very important. I'm just gonna tell a quick story um, I did this on our EWTN episode on Wednesday. I'll add a few things, just quickly summarize it. Then I want to add a bunch of new material that I just wrote last night. And so join us for this because Lourdes in France is the most visited Marian pilgrim site in the world. Do you know over 200 million people have gone there? This is important. And um, it's funny because where does God work? He works in places you'd never expect with people you would never expect. Where's Lords? Well, basically the ground that's past the river, past the grotto, where all this is going on was literally a garbage dump. And it's like, whoa. And this was used by the townspeople for trash. So the grotto there basically was unsightly in its appearance. It was desolate. So most people didn't go there. And, you know, even Bernadette didn't really regularly go there. But when she was 14, and who was St. Bernadette? She was just this poor, sick, uneducated peasant girl, just like Faustina. This is who God uses. This is why when people, when you guys watch these talks, you say, well, God can't do these great things in me. Yes, he can. Because these are the, the, the poor, the broken the, 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 the ones that are, 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 are suffering, this is who God uses. And so anyway, on February the 11th, so this is the date we celebrated yesterday, 1858, right? 
Bernadette and two other schoolgirls, they went to the grotto for firewood. And they got separated, <clears throat> and St. Bern Bernadette, just Bernadette at the time, ended up alone in the grotto. So here she is in this grotto. Now, if you haven't been to the Shrine of Divine Mercy, we have a grotto of lords. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll show a picture of that. But anyway, she took off her shoes and socks, and she tried to cross the shallow water of the river. Okay, so here's this little French girl in the French countryside, 1858, right after the revolution and everything else. And she heard what sounded like wind, right? And the wind blowing through the tree branches, but the bushes didn't move, right? So she said, quote, I saw a lady dressed in white, wearing a white dress, a blue girdle, and a yellow rose on each foot, the same color as her rosary that she was holding. Now, Mary took her rosary beads and made the sign of the cross and disappeared. Very odd. Mary didn't say anything. Now, I'm going to show you a clip that I went out and got and we put together. They don't make movies like this anymore. You've probably heard of the Song of Bernadette from the 1940s. We're gonna show you the little clip from the Song of Bernadette, that one little two minute scene where she sees Mary for the first time. So take a look at your screen. Okay, now sound down, please. Okay, if we could turn our sounds down, please. So thank you. That, that is an incredible clip that we see in one of the greatest movies, the, 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 the story of St. Bernadette and Lourdes. And so I love that clip. I just wanted to show that in case you've never seen it. And how beautiful that that captured. Now, the only thing is it wasn't black and white, so we can't see the beauty fully of Our Lady, but I think you see that. So what happened? <clears throat> All right, so Bernadette sees the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then she goes to the others, and she asks, did you guys see anything? And they said, no. And Bernadette asked her sister, she was one of the girls with her, not to say anything to their mother, but the mother found out, right? Like any good sister or brother, they tattled. <laughs> and so Bernadette's mom insisted that it was just an illusion. And she said, don't you go back there. So the daughter was told not to go back there. But anyway, 
Bernadette, like St. Faustina, this is almost identical. Her parents, St. Faustina's parents as well, told St. Faustina, shape up. You're, 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 you're not thinking correctly. And Faustina followed the inspiration of Christ, and so did Bernadette. So Bernadette went back to the place. Now, three days later, on February 14th, she said the small, young lady reappeared. That's interesting, Mary. Small, young lady. Beautiful, right? But again, she didn't speak. This is very odd. So then on the third visit, Bernadette said the lady asked that she come back to that same site for 15 days. Again, just like Fatima. Please, to the little child, come back. Come back. I want you to return. And she says, listen to this. This is the whole message of Lord's. I promise to make you happy, not in this world, but in the next. This is what the lady, our lady, told St. Bernadette. So now, 10 days later, February, uh, actually 13 days, February 24th, guess what our lady asked for? Again, just like Fatima. She asked for prayer and penance for the conversion of sinners. Please, if you can, join me today. There is all kinds of emails going around asking for prayer, penance, and fasting f this weekend for what's happening in Arizona. Uh, the gathering of the Satanists trying to consecrate everything to Satan. It's, it's, it's so diabolical. Satan is now completely playing his cards. We're, we're, we're at a point now where Satan knows his time is limited. And you know what this is like? This is, this is like the grand finale. Satan is realizing his time is, is limited and he's throwing everything plus the kitchen sink at it, right? But guess what happens when a team on the football field realizes they got to go for it? It's called a Hail Mary. And so we need to do our Hail Mary. And so Mary asks for prayer, penance, and conversion of sinners. This fits perfectly with what we are dealing with this weekend in Arizona. Now, the next day, February 25th, the word got out about what was going on, and hundreds of people accompanied Bernadette to her appointment with the lady. Again, just like Fatima. I mean, the, the, you couldn't make this stuff up. It, this is how Our Lady works. And so the people, just like Fatima, saw nothing at first. They saw Bernadette acting strangely, right? And the lady told Bernadette to dig in the ground and drink the water she found there. At first, the water was really dirty. All of a sudden, it turned crystal clear, like those mountain streams you see, right? And the people thought she was mad. They thought she was crazy. The, even the police commissioner barred her from going there. Again, just like Fatima. I know I keep saying that. But the, the, the connection is amazing. So still Bernadette went. So the crowds followed her, including a woman named Catherine Latape. And with two fingers that she had paralyzed from an accident she had a couple years earlier, Catherine took her two paralyzed fingers and she dipped her hands into that spring where Mary told Bernadette to dig, right? <clears throat> and where Bernadette drank the water. So this Catherine puts her fingers in and she was instantly healed. Well, of course, word is going to spread. So then on March 2nd, so we're not even a month into this, 1,600 people accompanied Bernadette to Masa Biel. This is what they called it. And in that apparition, now we're going to tie in Guadalupe, Mary knows what she's doing. She's consistent. If you have nothing else you can say about Mary, you can say she's consistent because she's the mother of God. There's no, there's no duplicity. And so she asked that a chapel be built. Now this is just like Guadalupe and that the people could come. And so what happened? Just like Guadalupe, the priest didn't believe her. Remember Guadalupe, the bishop didn't believe. So just like Guadalupe, what did the bishop do? He asked for something. 
And just like Guadalupe, this priest said, before I build a chapel, I need to know this lady's name. Now, what did Mary reveal her name as? It wasn't to the 16th apparition at Lourdes on guess what day? March 25th, the Annunciation, that Mary said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now, St. Bernadette's vision is therefore just like Juan Diego's, right? Both saints, listen to this, I bet you didn't know this. Both saints reported visions of a miraculous lady on top of a hill. Both visions referenced roses. Our Lady Guadalupe, the bishop wanted the roses, which were out of season, didn't even grow native there, and she got the, uh, Juan Diego got the roses from Our Lady. And here, Mary had roses on her feet in Lourdes. Both places, Mary asked that a church be built at the site. Both had to converse, con, uh, convince the clergy, and neither time did the clergy believe the little girl in, in Lourdes or Juan Diego in Guadalupe. But both times, Mary prevailed. Now, telling this then, uh, being notified of Our Lady's words, that she is the Immaculate Conception, the pastor believed, because little Bernadette didn't even know what conception meant. And just four years earlier, the church had declared Mary immaculately conceived in 1854. So this is all coming together. And so now it's a dogma of the church. Something Bernadette didn't even know what it was, what it meant. So Bernadette went to the grotto for the last time on July 16th. That's Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel, right? It was the 18th apparition. <clears throat> Now again, Mary didn't speak, but Bernadette knew this was the last apparition. She said, I've never seen her so beautiful. And so the church opened an official investigation that same year in November. And then a couple years later in 1860, it was declared authentic. So what happened afterwards? All right, that spring in the grotto, is now the focal point of all pilgrimages that go to Lourdes as a source of healing, both spiritual and physical. Listen to this. Since 1858, 7,000 people have come forward reporting healings. Now, the church isn't afraid of science. Everybody says the church is afraid of science. The church, in conjunction with the Lourdes Medical Bureau, a group of doctors and scientists, examines every case. They've declared so far 70, 70 are officially recognized as scientifically inexplicable. That is miraculous. All the other cases, they've been declared, you know, unknown. It doesn't mean they're not miraculous. They could all be miraculous, but they just don't have enough information. So there's insufficient evidence to be sure one way or the other, so we don't know. But basically, that means the number of miracles at Lourdes could actually be into the thousands. We don't know. Now, let's look at our next slide. This is the picture of Lourdes. So several churches were eventually built, including this basilica of St. Pius X. So if you have your phone or you're at home, you can see the basilica of the St. Pius X. So this church is large enough for 20, and we'll take our sound down, thank you. That church is large enough for 25,000 people. Now, there's plenty of room to social distance there. So please don't close that church, okay? So many believe that Lord's is the greatest Marian shrine in the church, and the events have backed that. And that's why now, Brother Mark will show the next slide, we have Our Lady of Lourdes officially on the church calendar for yesterday, February the 11th. Each year we celebrate this as her first apparition. It's also the first anniversary of Father Seraphim's death that we want to talk about in a minute, and I will. But let's finish with St. Bernadette before we go on to the next thing. You know, the connections, again, I just, 
I could sit up here for two days and talk about these connections, but I'll highlight just a few. Bernadette, St. Bernadette, she suffered from tuberculosis of the bone. Who's that like? Faustina. And a lot like St. Therese. She spent a good portion of her last years in the infirmary, and she died young at age 35. She struggled. She was young. She had, we know people like this. We know people who have endured this. And in my opinion, they're specially chosen by God. The suffering doesn't make sense to us. And we're going to explain it or at least try to in a minute. These people are carrying their cross, these Beautiful young people, St. Therese, St. Um, St. Faustina, St. Bernadette. And I've known so many people in our life that are young and, 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 and carrying crosses unimaginable. You know, two of the most special people that I've ever seen have to carry the cross were two of our employees at the Marian Helper Center. Suzanne Zavider was an inspiration to me. She passed away young, way before her time. She carried the cross. Mark Massery, you know, a beautiful employee of ours. It's, it's a joy to see his father with us here in the back. He, young, carried the cross. So many times we don't understand why God allows suffering. Let's try, at least try, to see what happened because it doesn't make sense to us. It didn't even make sense to Bernadette. A fellow nun accused her of being lazy bones. And Bernadette says, my job is to be ill. Whoa, Lord, I don't want that job. Give me another job. I'd rather be a professional athlete or a rock star, right? This is, or a musician, right? Be one of the Beatles. I'd rather be an astronaut. I'd rather be this. No, God has a job for you. Certain souls are handpicked by God to be suffering souls, to save souls. You know, when she was canonized, the saint, she was canonized on December the 8th. What is that? The Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And her incorrupt body lies in a convent in Nevers, France. Let's take a look at her picture. That's a picture of her incorruptible body in Nevers, France. So powerful stuff. Now, the last official miracle was just recently, within the last few years. I think it was like 2013. It was the 70th miracle that was declared at Lourdes. So there's some recent ones. Now the Immaculate Conception is a dogma of the church, means we have to believe it. It's, it's revealed by God. And so this is important. Now, for the beautiful people that are here, we have a nice crowd here today. And if you're not here, you, you can make it here this year. Let's look at our next slide. We Marians have a Lord's Grotto right off to the, my left outside and down the hill. Now that's a picture and it looks very accurate to the real Lord's Grotto. This is actually the picture of our Lord's Grotto here at the shrine. And our ladies up there, up in the grotto, into the, into the uh, little um, rock cove. And then we have an altar below it. Now what's fascinating is I've been going there since I was a postulant years ago, over 15 years ago, and 16 years ago. And I've been working here at the shrine for years, in and out. And I'll tell you this, if you come here to the National Shrine, and I'm saying it to all the people here, if you have a need for healing, please go to that grotto. Almost every time when somebody tells me that I meet somebody that says they've incurred a miracle here or an answered prayer here, I always smile and I say, if I may ask, did you make a particular prayer? Yes, Father. May I ask where? Almost, almost always, they tell me it was at the Lord's Grotto. You've heard me say this before. I'm not just saying it because it's today that we are talking about Lord's. I have said this for years 
to people who come here, there's something special about Lord's Grotto here. And this is a place we have been told of many miracles. God's not constrained just to Lord's France. Our Lady can appear anywhere. In fact, there used to be on the top of the grotto, if Brother Mark could put the picture back up, on the little cave, the cove down below where Mary is. So Mary's up in the upper right, and you can see the cove down below. Up on that ceiling, you might still see it if you're here on our property, there's a little bird's nest. And there's a little bird's nest that has now been abandoned, so I think it's probably decayed mostly, but some of it's still there. And when I was a novice, and I was going through a tough time struggling, Lord, am I called to marry Gina, or am I called to be a priest? This was killing me. One day I would get up convinced I was to be a priest. The next day I'd get up, I was convinced I was to be married. It was killing me. All I wanted was peace. I used to go down to this grotto. And when I would sit down at the grotto, there was a little blue bird. And she would come back every year into that nest. And she would lay her eggs in that nest and she'd be there. And every time I'd go down to that grotto, she'd fly out of that nest up onto the shoulder of the statue of Mary. And she would sing the entire time I was there. And as soon as I would get up and leave, she'd fly back to the nest. I was like, that's amazing. That was God's little sign. We all have them in our lives. I'm not just saying those things happen to a priest. No, they happen to everybody if we are opening and looking for them. Are we looking for where God is speaking to us or are we walking with our head like this or buried in our cell phone? These are the things, the messages that God gives us, these little tiny things. Amazing. All right, so these are the things that are talking about on Lord's Ground. Now, I didn't want to spend that much time, I'm sorry, on Lord's, but let's go to the next reason February the 11th yesterday was so big that you can continue today. That is our next slide, World Sick Day. You're like, what? We're celebrating a sick day for 30 years. Pope John Paul instituted this back in 1992, all right? This is very powerful. It's 30 years ago, John Paul II instituted World Sick Day to encourage all of us members of the church to be attentive to the sick and those who care for them. Boy, is that needed now more than ever. The sick with COVID and those who are in danger and treating them, they're brave, they're doing the works of Christ. So we should have gratitude for these people. But also, the Pope said that we should have gratitude for the advances in healthcare technology and pastoral care of the sick and realize that God calls healing through doctors and medicine. You know, there's a lot of people out there that say, if God wants me to get better, he'll heal me. And they neglect their heart medicine, or taking their child to the doctor, you want to be careful there. You want to be careful. Because we, we know that God gives us the tools to get better, right? But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're sick. Do you know what also February the 11th was? It was the anniversary of Benedict resigning as Pope because at least we're told for health reasons. Health reasons. There's so much going on on February the 11th. Well, Father, why are you talking about the day late? Because it's still in our hearts. All right? So Jesus offers the best witnesses to the mercy of the Father and the Father's love to the sick. That's your chance to be like God the Father. You know, it's interesting because when you help somebody who's sick or in need, you think, well, gee, I, lucky I was around. I really benefited them. I mean, that's the one thing, like when I went home with my mom, I was like, I'm not the one who, who helped her. She was the one who helped me. Because it gave a chance to be charitable. 
It gave a chance to be loved. I've said this before. A lot of the times I believe that my mom and dad are going through the suffering that they are. Now, I pray every morning that God takes it away. You should too. Pray every morning that God takes your suffering away. Jesus even prayed this in the garden. What did he pray? Lord, uh, Father, take this chalice away. Take this cup away. But then what did he pray? But not my will be done. Your will be done. So every morning I pray that my mom be healed, my dad be healed, everything be fine. That's what we should pray for. But I always pray, Lord, if you allow it, let it be redemptive for them. Now, I've said it before in a homily, but it's worth saying again. One of the reasons I believe that my family is going through this, myself included, is because we all were, were, were lacking something in the spiritual life. My, my mom, by her own admission, could not forgive her mother for the abuse, the physical beatings that she took as a little girl. We can't get to heaven with unforgiveness no matter what somebody has done for us. So my prayer for my mom was to forgive. And through my mom's suffering, and please, oh, I got a, some really bad letters saying, Father, how dare you say God is punishing and wants your mom to suffer and enjoys her suffering. Are you kidding? Do you think I ever meant that? And if I came across that way, I apologize. I'm never indicating that God wants us to suffer. In God's ordained will, he doesn't want suffering. He doesn't want us to get sick and to suffer. But in his permissive will, he may allow it. And there's a couple reasons. One is because it can purify us. My mom, if she would have went through her life unforgiving and died with just totally nothing wrong and just all of a sudden one day died without having been purified, there's danger for the soul there. But now my mom has been purified. She's gone through trial and tribulation. And sometimes that happens before even people take their own life. This is God at work in the soul. And so God is, I believe, allowing purification for my mom. So when I was home last time and my mom was just barely holding on to her, her faculties, I said, Mom, do you forgive Grandma? And she says, yeah. Do you think that that would have happened without my mom being purified? I don't think so. Now, am I saying that that's great? Thank you, Lord, for making my mom suffer like those letters I got? No, I didn't. And I don't mean that. Please don't take it that way. But my dad, by his own admission, said, I wasn't always there for you guys. I was always off on my own trips, my business trips, hunting or fishing, and left you guys at home by his own admission. My dad wasn't charitable in the way that he could have been. But now, you know what he said? He said, I thank God that he's given me the chance now to take care of mom in a way that I've never, ever done before. My dad has never been called to this level of charity in his entire life. Now, if my dad had died or my mom had died before any of this sickness, he never would have had a chance to be charitable. My dad may have passed away never having been charitable like that. And what does the scriptures tell us? We don't get to heaven without extreme charity, love. But now my dad says, I'm so thankful that I have the opportunity to take care of mom and show her that love that I didn't do earlier in my life. So now through this crazy way that God allows, this suffering may have brought the salvation of two souls that may have been lost. My mom for unforgiveness and my dad for lack of charity. Now all of a sudden, my mom's purified through her suffering. She's forgiven. My dad now has to take care of my mom. He waits on her hand and foot. He takes care of her. He changes her. He bathes her. He's never done that before. So in a super act, actual act of charity, because of the suffering they're going through. This is what we can't comprehend. God's ways are not our ways. And God will bring a greater good out of ways we can't even fathom. This is an example. And so the Pope pointed this out, and he said, God sometimes works in ways that we have no clue. He says we just have to trust. You know, 
This is, this is just so powerful. Um, Jesus healed. Okay, so when we're like that, when we're like my father, now we can become Christ to our loved ones, to strangers. On our EWTN show, please watch every Wednesday at 6.30, we just did a show on a woman up in Buffalo, Amy Bezos, that she's, she's taken upon herself to care for the, the sick and the suffering and the homeless in the area. And she's the hands and feet of Jesus. It's an incredible story. And so anyway, when we do that, we can be like the Father. We can show the Father's merciful love. You know, Jesus healed all manners of diseases and illnesses. It was an important part of his mission. And what did he do? He mandated. You want to talk about a true mandate? All right. A true mandate isn't closing a bunch of churches. A true mandate is taking care of the people you love, both physically and spiritually. By bringing them Christ, not shutting the door. And so Christ commanded the apostles to proclaim the gospel and heal the sick. So ministering to the sick is an important part of being a Christian. You know, back in the days, they would never allow this. When I was in North Carolina, I would take my big yellow lab, Rocky, to the nursing home. And I initially started visiting our church members from St. Mark's Huntersville in North Carolina. And, and the, the people in North Carolina were so great. God bless them. And I, they probably would still do it today, but I'm sure there's a million mandates that don't let them. I would literally take Rocky in there on a leash, and I'd take him up to the rooms, and the people loved him. There were some visitors, some people didn't have visitors for years, but they would just pet Rocky, and he was always looking for a free handout, free munch, and he would, I remember one time he dove under the bed of this precious old lady, she was like 99, and he's squirming on the bed, he's a big 100-pound lab, and he's squirming under the bed. I'm trying to pull him out. And he's squirming under the bed. And he came up with a piece of crust that had fallen underneath the bed. And that little 99-year-old woman laughed. And the, doc, the nurse told me they hadn't seen her laugh in years over a dog. And so this is how we can bring Christ to people, to touch the suffering flesh of Christ, not to be afraid were the, were the priests and nuns afraid in the Middle Ages when the plague, which is way worse than what we're dealing with now, people were dying a third of Europe, some reports say, died from the plague, but yet the priests and the nurses, they didn't, the uh, priests and the nuns, they didn't shut the churches. They opened them up and brought the people in and took care of them. They weren't afraid. That's what converted Europe. That's what converted the world. And now we're being asked to close our doors, shut ourselves behind things out of fear. That's exactly what the evil one wants. Wants us to be afraid. No. And the modern day lepers are the unvaccinated. Stay away from me. Don't even get near me. I've had so many people tell me they haven't seen their grandkids in two years because they're afraid. We can't be controlled by that. That's the devil that wants to control us. Pray for this situation. All right, so what did the Pope say? The Pope made this day of the sick to healthcare workers. God bless all of you healthcare workers. He said, dear healthcare workers, your service alongside the sick carried out with love and competence transcends the bounds of your profession and becomes a mission. Your hands which touch the suffering flesh of Christ can be a sign of the merciful hands of the Father. Be mindful of the great dignity of your profession as well as the responsibility that it entails. He also prays the technology and says that we need to use technology. That's how God gives us. People say, well, I don't want to go to the doctor. God will heal me. Yes, he'll heal you through the doctor. Right? And so we don't want to forget this. But he says, don't forget, though, that the dignity and frailties and the person are more important than their disease. So we have to remember, these are people. We don't treat it like they are leper outcasts. That's what Christ railed against in the gospel. 
vaccinated or unvaccinated, these are not lepers. Even lepers we shouldn't treat as lepers. We treat him as Christ. And so the Holy Father praised the chaplains and the others who bring Christ to the sick. And he said this, listen, I want to finish with this. He said, if the worst discrimination suffered by the poor, including the sick who are poor in health, is the lack of spiritual attention, we cannot fail to offer them God's closeness, his blessing, and his word. Guess where you do that? The churches. As well as the sacraments. Where do you do that? The churches. And the opportunity for a journey of growth in faith. So right there, the Holy Father is telling us that we can't just forget, we can't just focus on the physical. We have to focus on the spiritual. If people want to give up everything in our faith because they're afraid of the temporal physical, the eternal is a lot longer. And we can't forego our eternal salvation for that. So anyway, well, does the Bible then say faith healing is good? Does the Bible say don't worry about the doctors, just be healed by faith? A lot of non-Catholics say this. Now, atheists, I was just reading this the other night. Atheists say that the Bible is unscientific because it encourages faith healing, and they blame the Bible for many sicknesses today. I just read this powerful article where this group of atheistic doctors was saying that the Bible is the biggest problem because it's convincing people not to use medicine, not to get vaccinated. And so these group of atheistic doctors came together on this article and said, stay away from the Bible, basically. Now, they didn't use those words, but that's basically what they were saying because they were blaming the Bible for saying, you're trusting health, faith healing and you're not going to be healed. All right, so is this true? Does the Bible do that? Let's look at this. Praying for the sick instead of treating them with medicine developed, this is the question. The critics cite tragic stories of Bible-believing parents, right, who chose to pray for their sick children instead of taking them to the hospital, like a blown appendix. They then said religion is therefore dangerous. Okay, is this true? First, yes, there have been parents who have not taken their children to the doctor because they believe God would heal them and the child died. But is this what the church teaches? Is this what the Bible teaches? Actually not. All right, that's the individual person's belief. That is not the Christian teaching. All right. The Bible shows faith and medicine, believe it or not. Do you know medicine's in the Bible? Listen to this. Ezekiel 47.12 describes leaves that can be used for healing. Did you know that? Jeremiah 8.22, the Lord proposes, basically indicates that his people are ill because they didn't go to the physician. That's interesting. This was in the land of Gilead. I used to live on Gilead Road. In North Carolina. Colossians 4.14. Paul calls Luke the beloved physician. So that must mean there was some value in being a physician. And Jesus himself said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. Interesting. That's Mark 2.17. All right, now, some say that 2 Chronicles 16, verse 12, condemns medicine and actually says only have faith alone. Listen to why they say that. You can understand this. This is 2 Chronicles 16, verse 12. Listen to this. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians, and Asa died, dying in his 41st year of his reign. 
Now, atheists will point to that. Even some people will point to that and say, that's a problem. The Bible condemns medicine. It's just saying he didn't, that he trusted in the doctor and he died. This is what the Bible is messed up because it's, it's saying if you trust in the doctor, you're going go to you're gonna die. No. This passage actually tells us something that you may not have caught. Asa continually ignored the Lord and put his trust only in the physicians. Right? Like the king of Syria and nothing in God. What God is saying is trust me to heal you and then go to the tool that I use called the doctor. They go together. They're compatible. This is Catholic Church teaching. This Asa trusted only in the doctors to save himself instead of the Lord. Now, he never then trusted God. When I trust God, it's like, Lord, I'm trusting if you're going to heal me, I'll go to the doctor to be healed. I'd be dead right now. 2017, I had severe blood clots from flying all over the place. And I came within a whisper of dying. Then the next year, they found 99% blockage in the LAD of my heart. It's funny because they call it the widow maker. It's like, I don't have no wife. I'm not going to make no widow. But the spiritual, the church is our bride. So yeah, it would have been a widow maker. And, and I went to the doctor, R Marie Romagnano, who has her healthcare conference this weekend. She's the one that actually saved my life. She's the Marian nurse. How? Because I trusted God that through his doctors. All right? So the text does not, the Bible does not condemn Asa from relying on doctors. It condemns him because he didn't seek the Lord. You can do both, you know. Yes, the Bible says we should pray and ask God for help, including help when we are sick. This is true. And the Bible shows that we can do through the tools God gives us. Medicine, technology, doctors. You know, the Bible records numerous instances of people who could not be cured by man-made medicine. This is true, but only through divine intervention. Like, for instance, Mark 5, 25. But the Bible never says that we are only to pray in the face of illness and never rely on the help God gives us. The Bible never says that. And so let's look at our next slide. If Brother Mark can put up there, we're going to read it along with us. All right, listen to this. Sirach. When you are sick, don't be negligent. This is right from the Bible. This is incredible. Show this to your non-Catholic friends who say they don't need a doctor. God will heal them. When you are sick, don't be negligent, but pray to the Lord and he will heal you. And give the physician his place. For the Lord created him. Let him not leave you, for there is need of him. There is a time when success lies in the hands of the physicians. This is in the Bible. For they too will pray to the Lord that he should grant them success in diagnosis and in healing for the sake of preserving life. Wow. Just don't make that physician God. Some people won't care. I'm never stepping in a church ever again my whole life because my doctor says I might get COVID. Now you're making the physician God. Now, does that mean you shouldn't be prudent? No, be prudent. If you are at high risk, you are in absolute danger, absolutely you got to be prudent. But maybe call the church and say, priest, father, can you bring the communion to me? Just don't deny yourself the grace. That's all we're saying here. We're not saying not to be prudent. All this help comes from God. <clears throat> All right, so what about this? What about when you don't receive healing? How about when we ask God and don't receive healing? And sometimes doctors can't heal us. Are we saying that the doctor is always going to have the answer because he's God's tool? No, sometimes the doctors don't have the answer. Father Anthony's still struggling trying to find out 
what medical things he's struggling with. Poor Mark Mastery had Lyme's disease and many other struggles that doctors were struggling to diagnose. And sometimes they get the best of us. Sometimes we, 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 the body can't take it. And so we pray to God that we, we, we have mercy. Sometimes he allows them to be suffering souls, chosen specially for a mission that unfortunately ends in death. St. Faustina, 30s. St. Therese, 30s. St. Bernadette, 30s. Jesus, 30s. Mark Mastery, 30s. How many times we hear and see things we just don't comprehend? And so what we do then, don't lose faith if we do ask for healing and it doesn't come. Jesus says that we'll get whatever we ask though, Father, when we pray. How come I don't get what I ask then? What about that? Mark 11, 23 says, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come true, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you'll receive it and you will. Man, that's a tough one, isn't it? That's a tough one. Lord, what are you doing to me here? I totally trusted you. I believed that you were going to send me a wife. I believed and I trusted you, Lord, and I prayed and I thought you sent the right one before I became a Marian. Prettiest girl in North Carolina, add everything I could ever ask for. I wanted to get married, but it wasn't to be. How come, Lord, you didn't answer my prayer? Because God had another plan, a better plan. You know, there's a movement out there called Word of Faith, Kenneth Copeland and some others. And here's what they teach. They teach, are you praying for something big? Healing from cancer? a restored marriage, the best job you've ever had, a new husband or wife? How do you know your prayer will be answered? This non-Catholic group says, if you believe, you receive when you pray, your answer is on the way. If you believe, you will receive whatever you pray, your answer is on the way. Sorry. That's not Catholic Church teaching. He admits, in all fairness, that not all prayers are in fact answered as we would like. And they'll point out that the truth, they'll point out the truth that there are other factors to consider when it comes to healing and why people are not healed. They do say this. But here's what's interesting. Here's the two reasons that these non-Catholics give as reasons why people are not healed. One, they're not healed because their lack of faith. This is the most common reason given for suicide and why the church used to teach you were damned. If you've seen my book out now called After Suicide, that's not what the church teaches. It's not what the church teaches. And so they teach or they believe this other group that people are not healed because they have a lack of faith. Well, it is true, some do. Matthew 13, 58 shows that. They also said there's another group that are not healed because they didn't repent from their sin. Eh, there's some truth here. Psalm 66, 1 John 3. But to this group, failure to receive is their fault. But this is not always the case. Remember Jesus said that tower that fell on those people? He says, was it because of their sin? He said, no. Christians are called to suffer as Christ did, but not just because of their own sins or lack of faith, because of the sins of the world. We must complete what is lacking in the sufferings of, his, of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. That's right in scripture. Now, Christians are sometimes called to suffer for other people's salvation. Did you know this? As well as their own. This is what St. Faustina did. She suffered greatly 
I believe for my salvation. If it wasn't for St. Faustina, I would not be here today. St. Faustina suffered tremendously. I was on the wrong path, I can tell you that. The only things that mattered to me in this world were more money, a beautiful wife and fiance, and an incredible home on Lake Norman in North Carolina. That was all that mattered to me. If it wasn't for St. Faustina's suffering and how God used her and brought the message of mercy to the world, I'd never know about it. I wouldn't have found divine mercy. I wouldn't have had a reversion. I wouldn't be here today. St. Faustina suffered for my salvation. This is what it means to be part of the body of Christ. This is what it means to be a saint. This is what it means in the Catholic faith. It's not just about me and Jesus. Yes, it's about me and Jesus, but it's about me and Jesus and all of you. It may be that the person asking for the prayers is not healed because it's also simply not God's will. How could that be, Father? Those are the scathing letters I got. How dare you say your, it was God wanted your mom to be beaten by her mother? I never said that. God's ordained will, he doesn't want son, even a single bit of sickness, death, or suffering. But in his, his permissive will, he allows it. The reason is because it's the consequence of sin. And so some people have shouldered that burden. All the sin we're doing in the world right now, all that sin that's going on in Arizona as we speak at this very moment, they are doing black masses with consecrated, stolen hosts from Catholic churches. Please, when you go to mass, just keep an eye. Let the ushers know if you see somebody grabbing the Eucharist, putting it in their hand. And some priests I've noticed are just oblivious. They just go back out to distributing. I watch every single person to make sure that they receive. We had one case here not maybe a couple years ago where I distributed to the woman. She puts it in her hand. She walks away. I'm watching out of the corner of my eyes. I'm getting ready to distribute. She puts it in her pocket. She starts heading out the door. I stopped. And I said, ma'am, excuse me. She kept walking. She wouldn't acknowledge me. And I'm like, ma'am, ma'am. And she keeps walking right out that door. I literally chased her out the door. Nicely. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you need to consume. She's like, I'm going to eat it outside. And I said, no, ma'am, you need to consume that now. I'm sorry, you need to consume that now. She says, I'm not going to eat it now. I'm going to eat it outside later. And I says, ma'am, please hand me the host back. Who knows what was going to be done with that host? Who knows what sacrilege? They're already reporting that they have hundreds, if not thousands of stolen hosts to do this black mass this weekend. That takes a lot of reparation to the God, to the sacred heart of Jesus for the wounds that he's incurred. And there are some of us that, that give back that reparation through our suffering. Whether or not it becomes meritorious is whether you accept it or not. This is amazing. And a call like that, your call to share in the cross of Christ is difficult. I'm the biggest wimp when it comes to suffering. I run from it like a track star. But it bugs me because I wish I didn't. I wish I could embrace it more. Some people don't have a choice. They're given that suffering and they don't have a choice. But see in it somehow, some way that God's working behind the scenes. That that suffering could be redemptive for you or your loved one. God just confirming it with the bells. So, this is what's going on. Sometimes we only turn to him in times of trouble. This is the only time some people will ever turn to God. How many stories have I read and stories I've heard? That, oh, I don't need God. If nothing went wrong in our lives, we would never need God. We would never need him. Sometimes the only times we fall to our knees is when the suffering becomes so bad. You know, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, remember? Paul asked God three times to heal him from the thorn in his flesh. 
And what did God say? You know, Paul, you're doing a great job for me. Let me take care of that right away. What did, what did God say to Paul? No. Why? Why would God say no? He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. For now, that thorn's going to remain. For me, I'm convinced that the thorns that remain, and I got a million of them, is so that we realize how weak and broken and miserable we are without God. Paul said, after Jesus told him that, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah, it's tough. You know the Greek word for weakness is Athenaeus. As Athenaeus. And this is the same word for infirmity. So if God says your glory is made great in your weakness, he's talking about your sickness. Man, you Catholics are crazy. Well, then the Bible's crazy. We Catholics are the only ones who teach this. In Matthew 8, 17, it uses the word infirmities and references Isaiah 53, 4. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now remember, Jesus said, not my will be done, your will be done, Heavenly Father. So whatever we are asking for must be first God's will in our life. Whatever is against God's will is evil, and God can't do evil. So if you're asking God for something against his will, even if you don't know it, don't worry. Well, Father, I don't know. I don't want to ask. God knows if you know or not. It makes sense that God would not grant it. Go back to my example of a wife. I prayed every day, Lord, is Gina the right one? Am I to get married? Send me this wife. Send me the wife, Lord. God didn't answer. I mean, he answered it, but sometimes his answer isn't the way we want. His answer was no. Now I look back. I can't imagine not being a priest now. I couldn't imagine, but if, if, if it would have been up to me back then, I would say, give me that wife. This is what's going to make me happy. If somebody would have told me back when I was in high school I was going to be a priest, I would have cried. <laughs> I would have cried. And that would have just floored me. I can't do that. I don't want that. That's not what I want, Lord. Well, Lord knew it took years to get me on that path to finally realize I couldn't do anything else now because God had a better plan for me. This is what we have to understand. Now, this is, this is powerful. Some believe that Jesus took our firmities on the cross and thus, according to 1 Peter 2.24, this means that Christ accomplished everything on the cross by way of healing us and can and will be fully appropriated in our life today, right now, in this world, meaning everything, if you believe in that faith, will be perfect for you. You'll be healed of everything. You'll be given everything. I always point out, watch the danger. Watch the danger of these non-Catholic teachings. They're not the gospel. I told you the story. I was slipping through, looking for EWTN one night, and I came across one of those mega churches. Brother Mark has the uh, next slide. Uh, here's a picture of one of those mega churches. They're, they're sweeping Catholics out of the Catholic church by the millions. And I turn it on, and I'm listening. You, you want that new wife? You pray to Jesus, you'll get that new wife. You want that new job? You pray to Jesus, you'll get that new job. You want to be the manager? You believe you're the best. And when you believe you're the best, you'll be made that manager. I'm sitting there in disbelief. You, you're, you want that brand new house? You believe in Jesus, you'll get that new mansion. 
this is not the teachings of Jesus. This is not the teachings of the scriptures. This is dangerous. And I bring it up because it's destroying South America. South America, Brazil used to be 95% Catholic. Now it's below 50% because everybody's fleeing, looking for this prosperity gospel. That all I have to do is say, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to get more money. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to get fame. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to become a rock star or I'm going to become a, um, 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 a millionaire, a billionaire. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to have more money than I ever wanted. And this is what these mega churches are teaching. Please don't fall for this. This is dangerous. You're talking your soul here. Because the Bible tells us to be my disciple. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Now, does that mean we're supposed to be miserable? No. Jesus didn't look too happy on the cross. And neither do we. But the cross ain't the end. What happened after the cross? The resurrection. If the end of our existence as Catholics was the cross, I would agree with you. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm gone. I would agree. But it's not the end. The cross is the means to the resurrection. There is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. And these teachings are there's no Good Friday. One of these mega pastors was on Larry King and said, Larry King is Jewish, and he asked him, you never mentioned sin. He said, you never mentioned, he says, no, makes people feel bad. Seriously? If we don't have an awareness of our sinfulness and our need to repent and our need for God's mercy because we are miserably broken without him, we can't enter heaven. The Catholic Church teaching knows what she's doing. Because unlike being accused of not being biblical, we are the church that is biblical. And I, please, I, I correct myself because not all non-Catholic churches teach this. Please, I, I am not saying that at all. There are some great ones. There are some great ones. Um, Charles Stanley, I used to watch every day. Uh, who was that guy on the West Coast that used to be, Schuler? He, he was teaching beautiful teachings uh, out on the West Coast. So, no, there, I'm not trying to say every non Catholic fits in this category, not by any means, but just by the solid teaching of the Catholic Church, you have Scripture. All right, so let's get moving on to finish up here. So, the New Testament reveals that the fullness of the atonement of Christ will not be applied in our lives until we are in heaven. Romans 8.23 says, we wait for adoption as sons. We wait the redemption of our bodies. Now, we've all been redeemed. You've heard me say that because Christ's passion, death, and resurrection redeemed all mankind. But not all mankind will be saved. Jesus did his part. We're all redeemed. Now we have to do our part. Now salvation, yes, okay, I got to be careful here, does not depend on us. But what salvation does depend on is you cooperating with God. Your salvation depends on God, but it depends on you that you cooperate with it. All right, our bodies have not yet been fully glorified. Sometimes, according to God's will, the grace of God purchased for us on the cross will heal us. It will heal our bodies, but this is not the norm. It's called a miracle. When will you be fully healed? In heaven, in the confessional. Miracles do happen, but not always, not every day. Paul said, Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gift of healing? He said, no. It's not just our bodies that are not fully redeemed yet. Our souls, although fully redeemed through baptism and yes, Christ on the cross, they're not fully and finally redeemed as they are still subject to infirmity. How does that mean? 
Yes, Paul says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. You want to fear? Fear God. And that is why redemption is seen in the scriptures as not only an accomplished reality in the life of Christians, but also as a future and contingent reality called salvation. But basically, as I said, God has did his part. Now we have to do ours, meaning we cooperate, meaning we don't create the grace to be saved. We cooperate with it. Remember St. Augustine, God created you without you, but he will not save you without you. That's amazing. All right, wrapping up here. Sometimes people can ignore the reality that everyone is not healed. Well, then it must be your faith or your sin. We just went over that. Sometimes it's because you're a special suffering servant to bear with Christ on the cross to make atonement for the whole world. That's when we pray the chaplet. What do we say? Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. So you don't necessarily have to have a nail stuck in your shoulder. You could pick up that chaplet and do the same form of atonement. This is powerful stuff. And so some teach that everyone who is a true believer is supposed to be healed. If you truly believed, if you truly had faith, you would be healed. Uh uh. That's not Catholic teaching. Some remain carrying the cross till they die, AKA Faustina, Therese, Bernadette, Jesus. This, if we tell people, this can lead to a loss of faith when a real crisis happens, when a child dies or a person is not healed. We're going to tell them it's because they didn't have faith? I talk to people all the time because of our suicide book that say, Father, I'm being told that, that Sally took her life because she didn't believe in God. She didn't trust in him. She didn't have any faith. Is this true? I don't want to believe it. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that's true. We're going to give you a place to get that book. If you've known anybody who is suffering through the loss of a tragedy, how you'll never get over it, but you can get through it. We'll show that. God's ways are not our ways, as I said, but he will do what is best for us in the eternal picture. And some of those who have suffered greatly, it's because God had a special plan for them. It's crazy for us to believe that. St. Therese or Teresa of Avila You've heard the story when she was riding the horse or whatever in the carriage and she fell off into the mud and she got all cut up and muddy and bruised. And she said, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? And he said, that's how I treat all my friends. And she said, no wonder you have so few of them. <laughs> and so we have to understand this. When we ask God to heal us, we need to accept God's will, his permissive will, if he allows it. Right? Right? Even if his will is not yet our will, or I should say if our will is not yet his will. This is total trust. This is accepting, even if we don't understand it. This is surrender. The will of Jesus as a man, 1 Timothy 2, was always to conform to the will of God the Father, not his own. But if we would... Just pray the words of Christ in faith, begging for God's grace. We'll be amazed that little by little, our will will start to conform to God's will. You know what once was told me? You know what the cross is? The cross is when our will goes opposite of God's will. And in those cases, we got to follow God's will. But the more that our will is opposite direction of God's will, the more heavy our cross will be. Well, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Because he was bearing the heaviness of our will going against God's will. He was bearing that. He was suffering for that. He was a suffering servant. Isaiah says so. But if we would just do this bit by bit, we can come to conform to God's will. That's the greatest commandment of all. 
The two great commandments are what? Love God and love your neighbor. But if you put them together, what are they basically saying? Do the will of God. It is God's will that you love him. It is God's will that you love your neighbor. You want to bring the two commandments into one, the one greatest commandment, do the will of God. Ultimately, that is the only way to true peace. And what we discover over and over in the spiritual life is that God has a tendency to work far more powerfully through our infirmities, through our brokenness, through our misery, than he would have done through our strengths and power. Wow. Why? Because we surrender. You know, this blew people away. When I said a a few months ago that even Satan works in God's plan, people are like, Father, now you've really gone off the deep end. No, Satan works in God's plan. Why? Why? Because Jesus told St. Faustina, the only way we are saved is through his mercy. Okay, gotcha. Well, your mercy, or you're only going to get mercy from God, is if you recognize you need it. I need your mercy, Lord. Repentance. And the only way that's going to happen is if you recognize you're in need, that you're broken, that you're miserable. Okay. Guess what Satan does? Satan tells you you're miserable. You're broken. Don't talk to Satan. But yeah, I am miserable. I am broken. Thanks for exposing that. Now, Lord, I need your mercy all that much more. Now Satan's going, dang it. That is how God can even use brokenness. Incredible. His power is made perfect in our weakness. This is what St. Paul teaches. This is what the Catholic Church teaches. It's not all about you're going to get that great big new home. It's all about recognize God may be using me to share in his cross, and he only gives that share to those special to him. That's scary. So what can we do in the midst of suffering? Go back to the big four that I used to talk about. I always put things in the big four. I did a talk a year ago that talked about how to bring loved ones back to the church, and I said do four things. Those same four things apply to you in the midst of suffering. What are they? Let's have Brother Mark show the screen. One, have masses said. Have a mass said for yourself. Do you know one mass said why you are living is worth more than a thousand masses after somebody's dead? Why? Because the grace has a chance to affect a change in you. After you're dead, there's no chance to affect a change. It's still valuable. We still need to do it. But when you're alive and you have mass for a live person, there's a chance that that grace can actually start making changes. That's why the mass is so powerful for the living. If you are suffering, have a mass said for yourself. You can call our Marian Helper Center. Call the shrine here and say, like a mass said, we can do the masses for you. Or your local parish. You can have the masses come. Come on in. You can have the masses said for yourself. Next, pray the chaplet and the rosary daily. That's because the chaplet and the rosary are like the mass. The first part of the mass is liturgy of the word. The rosary is like liturgy of the word. It's meditation on scripture. Rosary is not a bunch of Hail Marys only. You're meditating on scripture, the life of Christ. Secondly, the chaplet is like the other part of mass. The liturgy of the Eucharist, offering sacrifice. Sacrifice. The chaplet is offering sacrifice. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity. We could do that because by our baptism, we share in the common priesthood of Christ and a priest offers sacrifice. You know, the biggest thing missing from the prosperity gospel of those mega churches, the single biggest thing that does not exist in those mega churches that is missing is sacrifice. It's all about gimme. I have faith alone. I'll get that new car, get that new beautiful wife, get that new home, gimme. Even with all the faith in the world, that's not what our faith is about. The faith is sacrifice, which then leads to glory. We end up in the same place, glory. But Jesus didn't come to earth and go right back up to the Father. He went to the cross. And so will we. So those are missing sacrifice. That's what the Mass is. What is the Mass? The Mass is two things. It's a meal, so it's community. This is why we can't close our churches, and it's a sacrifice. 
Powerful stuff. All right, and I want to finish with a little tribute to Father Seraphim. Oh, and also, don't forget, if you're suffering and sick, pray to the patron of physicians. Who's the patron of physicians? St. Luke. Somebody got it. St. Luke. All right? And which angel had the title, God is healing? God has healed. Raphael. So Luke, for patron of physicians, the angel Raphael, God is healed. So I just want to say a few things about Saint, or, uh, Father Seraphim. Let's take a look at our next slide. This is Father Seraphim. If you don't know who Father Seraphim is, I'd just take five minutes to close up here today. He died on February the 11th last year on Lord's Day. He was 90. God bless him. Do you know he had a miraculous healing at Lord's? Many people don't know this. Before I was even a Marian, he got lymphoma. And he was down to 80 pounds. Brothers were saying he looked like a skeleton. And he went to Lourdes. Completely healed. Completely healed. Seraphim, Father Seraphim, do you know was the reason that we have the Feast of Divine Mercy? Well, not the reason. One of the reasons. Of course, Faustina and others, most of all God, of course. But Father Seraphim is part of the reason we have the feast, the image, the diary, and a canonized Faustina. Man, that's quite a resume. In the 1940s, he belonged to a church just up the road from here in Adams, Massachusetts. It was the first place in the Western Hemisphere to have the image of divine mercy. Joseph Yarzembowski, the great Marian who brought divine mercy over, came to his church to St. Stanislaus in Adams, Mass. If you've never been there, whoa, 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 beautiful. They tried to close it, but the parishioners kept the church open. It's now remained open. And this Father Joseph Yarchabowski came and spoke about divine mercy when Seraphim was young. Now get a load of this. This was the same parish that the very first director of the Association of Marian Helpers who created it, Father Pelchinski, came from. The same parish. I'm Father Joseph. That's an honorary title because I'm the director of the Association of Marian Helpers currently. Father Pelchinski created it. He was the first Father Joseph, which is a title. And he was from the same parish as Seraphim. They were both marrying fathers. And get a load of this. Father Pell died on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December the 8th, back in 2000. Father Seraphim died on the Feast of Lords, where Mary said, I am the Immaculate Conception. And the Immaculate Conception is only celebrated on two days in the church calendar. You guessed it, December the 8th, when Father Pell died, Father Joseph, who I had the honor of following, and February 11th, Our Lady of Lords, when Father Seraphim died. We Marians are the first men's community in the world to bear the title the Immaculate Conception. 350 years ago, way before the dogma was declared. We are the first also men's community founded in Poland. And what did Jesus say? A spark will come from Poland to prepare the world for my final coming. Where do the Marians come from? Poland. And we believe we are part of that spark. Of course, it was Faustina, Divine Mercy, John Paul, and Father Seraphim and Father Pol uh, Pell, totally Polish. Totally Polish. A spark will come from Poland. The Marian fathers are chosen for a mission, and that is why you are here with us. You wouldn't even hear it of St. Faustina in some ways if it wasn't for Father Seraphim. Let's look at our next picture. This is St. Faustina. Father Seraphim smuggled photographic images of her diary out of communist Poland back in the 1970s so that we know who Faustina is. He translated the diary, right, into English and helped translate overcoming faulty translations into Italian to put that temporary ban on it. He was the vice postulator for both Faustina's miracles, the beatification and the canonization. 
along with Blessed Michael Sapochko, John Paul II, and St. Faustina herself, Seraphim stands as a central figure to make divine mercy, the, image, or the message and the devotion, the greatest grassroots movement in the history of the church. And it makes sense because Jesus said that divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. He waited the best for last. God gave us the greatest grassroots movement in the history of the church for the end times. Now, we don't know when the end times will be. Please don't call my bishop saying, Father said that the world's going to end tomorrow. It might be tonight. It might be 10 years. <clears throat> it might be 100 years. It might be 1,000. But all we know is that God said the world now needs divine mercy more than ever. And he used Faustina, Seraphim, and you. Just by the very fact that you're watching, you're part of this. He was the rector here at the National Shrine, and actually it wasn't a national shrine. He helped make it a national shrine. He was instrumental in getting the feast of divine mercy proclaimed throughout the church. He collected thousands of signatures. He helped spread it on EWTN. Brother Mark and I have been watching all kinds of clips of Saint, uh, Father Seraphim on Mother Angelica, spreading the message. Welcome spreading the message of divine mercy. He even got the Marians to restore. Let's say Brother Mark saw the old, this is the original image of divine mercy as we found it in Lithuania. Soot, dark, looks like a ghost. Look at that image, that's the original image. Then Father Seraphim, let's go to the next image, paid for it to be restored in the most credible way to the original form paid the finest reform artist in, 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 in Europe. And he did it through you. You guys donated the money for that or we wouldn't have the image today. And I want to finish with an incredible passage because there's a passage in the diary. Now remember, Father Seraphim Menkelenko, his real name was Stanley. But S.M., Seraphim Menkelenko, he helped give us the image of divine mercy. Now I want to read a very special passage in the diary and we'll finish. Look at diary 1689 on your screen. This is St. Faustina. Today, I saw two enormous pillars implanted in the ground. I had implanted one of them myself. And a certain person, S.M., the other. We had done so with unheard of effort, much fatigue and difficulty. Boy, if that doesn't explain Father Seraphim. And when I had implanted the pillar, I myself wondered where such extraordinary strength had come from. And I recognized that I had not done this by my own strength, but with the power which came from above. These two pillars were close to each other. Now remember, she said she planted one and somebody named S.M. planted the other. She said, these two pillars were close to each other in the area of the image. Nobody did more for the image than Father Seraphim. And I saw the image raised up very high and hanging from two, these two pillars. In an instant, there stood a large temple supported both from within and from without upon these two pillars. I saw a hand finishing the temple, but I did not see the person. Okay. <clears throat> there was a great multitude of people inside and outside the temple and the torrents issuing from the compassion of heart of Jesus were flowing down upon everybody. Do you guys know what? Father Seraphim, when he went to her canonization, was accidentally left in the back of the crowd. And he was so humble. And all the other Marians went up front and they said, Father Seraphim, we couldn't see you. St. Faustina just wrote, I couldn't see this person. She had a view of her own canonization. But Father Seraphim could not be seen. He was way stuck in the back by accident. In our hearts, I believe, and many here believe, SM is Seraphim Minkalenka. He always said it, what's well, not me, of course not. That's Michael Sapochko, just reversed. 
MS. No, Father. Michael Sapochko would have been MS. This is SM. Plus, this woman says she didn't know who the man was. She knew who Blessed Michael Sapochko was at the time she wrote this. She knew who he was. What are all these graces? They're showered upon the world. At her canonization, John Paul actually announced we are now going to have the feast of divine mercy for the whole world. And you know what else? It wasn't planned. And in her diary, St. Faustina says she saw St. Peter. She saw her own canonization. And she says she saw St. Peter go up where the Holy Father was. And the Holy Father is canonizing St. Faustina. She's seeing this. She's writing about it. And she says she saw St. Peter go up and whisper in the ear of the Holy Father. Now, if you watch that day, you can see what's going on. The Holy Father is like in a trance, John Paul. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, he announced the feast of divine mercy. I personally believe St. Peter whispered in his ear, it is time. The next thing that's so powerful is Father Seraphim died in the way Faustina did. Remember we talked about the suffering? St. Faustina died of tuberculosis. Father Seraphim died of pneumonia related to COVID. Both spent time in the hospital towards the end of their lives enduring diseases regarding respiratory systems that would ultimately take their life. St. Faustina suffered. Father Seraphim suffered. So let's pray. Pray for him asking divine mercy. The divine mercy whom he served so well will welcome him into heaven. So, our last slide. Let us pray. You know, I've always said that, uh, and this is Father Seer from on the screen, that Jesus said the student is never greater than the teacher. Father Seraphim is our teacher, and that's never been more true. None of us carrying on the footsteps will ever be as good as our teacher. So usually I give you the blessing right now. I'm going to let Father Seraphim do it. So take a look at your screen on the last video the Father Seraphim ever made. Dear friends, may the blessing of Almighty God and His mercy be upon you through His grace and His love for humankind at all times, now and always, and forever and ever, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you, Father Seraphim. And God bless all of you through that special blessing of Father Seraphim. You know, Father Seraphim's dream was to spread the message of mercy, to bring people into the Marian family. If Brother Mark can put up, be part of our Marian family through the work of people like Father Seraphim, please visit micprayers.org. It doesn't cost anything, takes but a minute. You can be part of our Marian family. So many of you are, and God bless you, the fruits of Father Seraphim. And a lot of this that we talked about is on my DVD. If Brother Mark can show that, you can get Explaining the Faith. This is not my Saturday Talks. This is Parish Missions. So if you haven't gotten it, you can get it at shopmercy.org or 800 Four six two seven four two six, and finally, my book out there called "Understanding Divine Mercy" talks a lot about Father Seraphim's teaching, the octave, the eighth day, all that good stuff. You can get that book also at Shop Mercy or eight hundred four six two seven four two six. And lastly, we want to mention the after suicide book because a lot of misunderstandings about what the church teaches about suicide. You can visit us at suicideandhope.com. You can put the name of your loved one. And if you've lost anybody, not just a suicide, but any kind of tragedy, please take a look. If you can't afford any of these things and you really want them or you'll read them or you truly think they will help you, send an email to peterjames at marion.org and I'll take care of it. I'll send it out to you. If you really can't, that's fine. It's more important for us to be able to get this message out there. 
So please, if you can't afford any of these, Father, I have no money. I really can't even spare even a dollar. Let us know. Because it's more important to get this message of mercy out there to the world. God's blessed us abundantly. We want to give back. And so please know that when you do purchase or you buy or you donate, it all goes back into this ministry. Praise be to God. Thank you, Father Seraphim, for allowing us to be able to carry on this work. And most of all, praise be to God. And let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.